Hello and welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner with Karen Sharp Price. This podcast will inform and inspire you in your quest to find the right career path. If you're just starting out, looking to make a change in your field or transitioning into a new career, then this podcast is for you. We will be sharing tips and providing resources on topics such as writing resumes, interviewing, using LinkedIn, and networking. We will take a look at different careers, companies, and opportunities. You will hear success stories from professionals in all career paths, and so much more. You will leave this podcast with three key takeaways that you can easily put into practice. Enjoy! Welcome to Sharp HR Career Corner Podcast. Today, we're talking to Soda Kuchkowski from Start With Sleep. Welcome, Soda. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really interested. I know we've never met but uh, in person, but I would really like to learn more about sleep and wellness and how that impacts wellness if you don't get enough sleep. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you became passionate about sleep in the sleep industry? Uh, so I guess the conversation starts with education, you know, from a young age, uh, le- a love for learning was instilled in me. My mother spent her life's work in education. So I guess it starts there. And that kind of translated when I got into medical marketing and sales. And in order to sell anything, right, you have to create value and you have to educate the consumer. Mm -hmm. So that's where there was like that translation. I always had a passion for sleep from very young age. Anyone will tell you I was even in my twenties, I was the one who would go home and I would take a nap if I knew that I had to like work long hours and so forth. So I think it was innately in me that was, you know, obviously it's based on lifestyle choices. So I always chose to prioritize it. So when I entered the field, everything about it just fascinated me, especially, you know, the science of sleep, but with my business, you know, I'm always talking about transforming science into meaningful action, because unless you know how it, to apply it and that practical application to your life, it really, a lot of times we get confused about, um, you know, the benefits or how to even achieve it. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And so in 2000, was it in 15 that you started, um, start with sleep? Yeah. So I spent the last 16 years in uh, sleep medicine and sleep health. Seven years ago, I started my business. So we're a community resource for sleep health education. So I provide seminars and programming for corporate wellness initiatives. I'm the instructor and I partner with a program out of California, the International Parenting and Health Institute for a certification program for adult sleep coaching for health professionals. Uh, And then I do a lot with school programmings as well. And I I have a retail center and resource center where I provide coaching, consulting services. But because of COVID, you know, over the last two years, my my company has really grown globally. So it's not just local to Western New York. It's really on a global scale because we can be on the the Internet. Right. So you can. Right. Anywhere. Yeah. You know, COVID hit so hard and people, um, you know, saw all the, the downside of it. And there was many. But for a lot of us, there was a lot of of good that came out of it because we got to reevaluate what we were doing and how we were doing it. And I feel as though for my business, I'm more efficient the way I do things because I use, I'm remote instead of in person all the time. And I've helped people in Italy and I've helped people in Wisconsin and Florida. So, you know, I would never have even considered those things um, until this happened. So it's just interesting how how things happen and and what good comes out of it. You got to always be looking for the good, I guess. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. I mean, I had worked with clients in other states and other countries, but I mean, it it definitely grew during the pandemic and being able to reach people in in every corner of the world. Yeah. The scope of my business. So what do you see as like a main, and maybe it's not just one, but what are the main contributors to people not being able to sleep these days? Well, like they should. I think it's a culmination of a number of things, right? First is that hustle culture. That was one thing that a lot of people reevaluated during COVID. You know, we're constantly trying to do as much as we possibly can, which means we're compromising, you know, our health, our self-care, our mental health. We're trying to, you know, we're constantly saying yes to others, but maybe necessarily that means we're saying no to ourselves. So reevaluating those choices. I think, you know, obviously it started with things like the industrial revolution, right? Like we there was no longer such thing as a nighttime, right? We were operating 24 hours a day. A lot of businesses moved to that. And that's where, you know, while I'm certified in maternity, child and adult sleep, my main focus is on those shift workers. So people who have circadian rhythm disruption. So your first responders, protective services, teens, we see, you know, 
when we see that misalignment in that 24 hour clock, that's where I specialize because the average person, if they pay, pay attention and they prioritize it, they can re reset their sleep pretty quickly. But it's really? in those challenging cases where I really love it because that's where I can really help someone uh, apply the things that I've learned you know, over my career. So does it matter the person, the gender, the age on how much sleep you should get a night? Yeah, so I mean, from you know, from babies to school age, to teens, to adults, to, you know, sleep as we age, the senior population, there's different changes in sleep patterns, sleep architecture. So there's different pockets of time when we're younger, obviously they need more sleep because their development, they're developing, but, you know, sleep affects our physical, mental, and our emotional health. So it's important for everyone at any stage. The mm -hmm. thing that I like to focus on more than how much sleep someone's getting is how well they're sleeping. So my passion is in changing the conversation about the importance of sleeping well, because the quality of your sleep dictates the quality of your life. You know, I like to say that it is a catalyst for achieving your personal and your professional goals, because when we're well rested, we're better at everything. We look better, we feel better, we're more creative, focused, we can concentrate better, we feel healthier, you know, yeah. we move quicker. So it's, it's just, it's so integral in so many of the important things that, that we want to achieve in our lives. So have the chain, you know, like have the reasons for people throughout time changed or have the have the circumstances and the the contributing factors stayed the same um or is it because of like the industrial revolution where things changed and you know in the olden days when they were on the farm it got dark at six and everybody went to bed because there wasn't much to do and the lights weren't on <laughs> so you almost were forced to go to sleep but nowadays because of electricity because of social media because of finding you can find anything online at any time of day or night tv is on 24 7 so if you wake up in the middle of the night you turn it on it makes it easier um but do you feel like it's those types of reasons and just the way generations have changed that have caused um problems and circumstances because there was always people working different shifts correct and so not those always i mean there, there were later shifts but not on the 24-hour clock that we work now and you know even with the shift workers now it's like they're not just working you know even if it's a later shift that's eight or ten hours we're talking people work 12 16 18 sometimes 24 hours you know my firefighters are 24 hours on mm -hmm. you know 24 hours off these these kind of rotating shifts as yeah. well these swing shifts shift work is really defined by anything that's out of the nine to five and we have a ton of that in this area because not only those first responders and protective services but hospitality transportation you know we see shift work in a lot of these different industries, huh. but I think you hit it right on uh, the nail right on the head when you were talking, kind of listing all the factors, the one kind of thing that brings all those together is light. Light works like medicine for our, our body, right? It, it influences or it can disrupt our 24 hour clock. And when that clock is disrupted, we can see a number of things happen, right? We can become pre-diabetic, you know, the, um, the quality are, are we can become hypertensive like the quality of our sleep very quickly on a short term basis we can see a number of different things that can happen but because we have all of these things at our disposal like you said we're looking at our phones it's that proximity to our face right the the tv is always on we're always inundated with light in one way or another and we're not using it to our benefit, right? Regulation of light is actually really important to being able to sleep at night. We don't get enough natural light during the day. Maybe we're wearing glasses and we're blocking out that sun. We need to send a signal to that optic nerve and that turns on a number of processes in our body. But at night, we're overly exposing ourselves. So you had mentioned about getting up in the middle of the night. A lot of these night lights have like LED lighting. So all it takes is a fraction of a second. You see that light in your brain, is you start making lists and you're, you're oh. all of a sudden you're awake, right? So all it yeah. takes, is just a fraction of a moment to be exposed to that light and it alerts your body that it's time to be awake. So it's a signal that it sends to us, right? So if we're constantly exposing ourselves to that, mm -hmm. then we're constantly moving our sleep pattern, causing trouble with falling asleep and then maintaining our sleep. And that's where we see a lot of these uh, sleep disruptions that occur. Okay. So I'm going to ask for a tip. So as a woman who's had children, I have to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. <laughs> So are you, what do you use then for light to get you from the bedroom to the bathroom and back without waking that, because that does absolutely happen. I lay back down and then, and then if there's something that's worrying me or on my mind, it's the very first thing that hits me. And then I'm, and then I'm awake for, it could be hours. So the, in terms of light an orange, like an amber, okay. like an orange or red light is, is going to be the best for that. 
The okay. problem is that a lot of these products that come out in terms of sleep, they have that LED lighting, which is actually very disruptive. Yeah. Now, a lot of these companies are starting to invest in like scientific advisors to hopefully help guide them down the right path. What we see is we have more accessibility to information and sleep products than we've ever had, but we have a, a larger sleep problem than we've ever had because a lot of times we're misapplying the science. And that's one of those things as well, where why would you make a nightlight at night that it's going to send signals to your body that it's time to be awake? We should make everything like when alarm clocks first came out they had the red light that was conducive to allowing your body to fall back asleep huh. right so but now it's this bright light or we pick up our phones to see what time it is and now we send a signal to our brain that's time to be awake and all of a sudden we're counting down the minutes like oh if i fall asleep now i'll have four minutes and <laughs> yes <laughs> and i'll have I four hours that. and 13 minutes and we do like the countdown so we kind of <laughs> do it to ourselves in that respect yeah, we absolutely do. So do you see a problem um, between gender for, with sleep problems? Well, there are definitely uh, differences in gender. I do presentations on men's health and women's health. With women, we need 20 minutes more of sleep, but we also have a higher threshold for um, sleep deprivation. But on the same token, in, as a gender, we are we tend to be more, have a larger undiagnosed population when it comes to sleep disorders because a lot of times... We are not familiar with the symptoms or, you know, there could be snoring or not snoring. We don't attribute a lot of these things. There's, there's upwards of 90 different sleep disorders. So we see a large un undiagnosed population, but in terms of, you know, disparities, I think it's more about uh, minority and marginalized communities. We see the biggest disparities when it comes to sleep, but no, there are definitely differences in gender. Huh. Now, are there some countries where people get better sleep than others? <laughs> yeah, there are. Uh, there are certain like uh, cities and so forth. But in terms of sleep overall, yeah. the United States uh, for employees who sleep less than seven hours per night, it cost the US economy an estimated $411 billion. And in second place is Japan at 138. So we are the worst. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> On a global scale, we are the worst in terms of sleep. Yes. Oh my gosh. And it, it, that's amazing that it's only 20 minutes more that women need. That's it. Is that a cycle? On average, <laughs> we need about 20 minutes more sleep than our male counterparts. That's what? just in studies. That we're How many minutes is a cycle? Uh, so an average adult sleep cycle is 90 minutes. So it's 70 to 110 minutes, but it, that okay. varies again per individual. Hmm. Okay. Um, do you focus on certain genders or age groups more than others? I mean, if I had to target, I would say that my primary market is probably between the ages of 35 and 55 and women. But quite honestly, I mean, like I said, I've, when I first started my business, I have programs. I have a program called the Baby Sleep Collective that's focused on helping new parents and, you know, parents in the first year because they lose, you know, upwards of a I could have used you for that. Yeah. <laughs> An hour, <laughs> thousand hours of sleep at the beginning, but my my business has kind of uh, shifted in that I do a ton of seminars because of the type of uh, industries that we have in this area in terms of shift work. I spend the primary amount of my time in that and in the, um, the certification program, just because there's only one of me. So I'm trying to certify health professionals all over the world to kind of get in this field, because I feel like there's so much opportunity in the area of sleep, you know, like, I, I always label myself like a, like an accidental entrepreneur. I have experience in education, technology, graphic design, business, you know, uh, marketing, uh, business development, marketing, but I entered into marketing and sales, right. In the health field. And yeah. that's where this all kind of transpired. I have, I've created my own little niche in the world because I've had such an opportunity because the lab that I worked with was affiliated with the university of Buffalo. So oh. I was able to be in both behavioral and medical, um, sleep medicine, right. Oh. My medical director. I mean, I just, I, was just exposed to a knowledge of information. We ran the fellowship program. Then I was certified as a sleep coach. So I've kind of paved my own way instead yeah. of like a traditional healthcare path. But when I work with my students, you know, they work in all different types of wellness uh, professions. And I tell them it's really about supporting others, right? I have a passion for what I do and I, I made a career out of it, right? Like I created my business because of what I saw lacking in the community, bridging this gap between you know, sleep medicine and sleep health. Like we were only addressing it once someone has developed a, a, um, a medical sleep disorder, right? Or a breathing yeah. disorder versus addressing the quality of their sleep, 
which in turn helps to maintain and manage their short and long-term health, right? So I mm -hmm. wanted to get out into the public and kind of share my messaging. And it didn't matter, you know, if I was an MD or a PhD, because I kind of went to the school of life, I guess, when it came to that. I mean, I have a master's in education and I have a BA in communications and all these other things, but it was kind of diving deep into my industry, learning everything and kind of being there at the beginning, right? Because sleep is one of the newest of all the specialties. We only have been really sleep medicine as a specialty has been the last 60 years. Isn't that amazing? So, you know, and what we're studying is so new compared to all of the other health fields, but yeah. it's the foundation for our health. I mean, I recently, um, something great happened, the American Heart Association. So I am a speaker for them for the last four years. And I oh. always make the joke about, you know, when are you gonna add sleep to one of the pillars of a healthy heart? And it was, I think it's just shy of two weeks ago, they finally labeled sleep as one of the eight pillars for a healthy oh heart. My I would talk about, you know, you see someone that runs a marathon, right? They seems like they have like 2% body fat, they eat right, they drink right. But if their sleep is off, they're still 200% more likely to suffer a stroke or heart attack in their lifetime. So you could also be the person who is obese. You're not eating right. You're smoking, you're drinking, right? But if you're well rested, you actually have better, like, I mean, obviously those things yeah. are not that great, but in terms of like the health of your heart, mm -hmm. it's all relative, right? So sleep is, is the foundation. For it's so interesting. Cause you, you yeah. do, um, you know, not, not terribly often, but you do hear about people who are marathon runners and exercise like crazy and go to the gym and then they end up having, you know, health, major health issues and strokes or whatever. And you wonder how, how could, you, how could they, they, they were always at the gym. They were always running and you wonder. They were, how. they were um, the American um, Academy of Sleep Medicine and some different organizations were in Washington, not too long ago, a couple months ago, talking about the fact when we talk about people, you know, they, they passed away peacefully in their sleep. A lot of that has to do with cardiac failure, your brain, your muscles aren't getting enough oxygen, right? Like there's a reason for that. There are different variations of sleep apnea. Uh -huh. So I think sleep is very much a missing part of the conversation when it comes to our healthcare. Well, that's huge kudos for you to get that to happen. My gosh. That must well, been... I'm just trying to recruit more people. Like I'm like <laughs> coming to the sleep space. There's so much opportunity. Like I mentioned, you know, in maternal health, we have like baby sleep consultants, but I mean, there's, there's opportunity for like to train nurses and to support new parents. I mean, I obtained that certification when I was pregnant with my daughter, because I went for a tour at the hospital and they were teaching me how to, you know, obviously how to swaddle. They had you, the a school of dentistry come in and show us how to brush teeth. I'm like, this is my first child. I've never really? held, like, <laughs> I need to know the fundamentals. Like I've heard I'm not, you know, I, I'm in sleep, but it's a whole other sector. I wanted to have those support services, you know, yes. I mean, there's so many opportunities that exist in this field because it is so new. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking for a new career path, <laughs> yeah, no, honestly. And, and it's amazing that it's only like you said, 60 years old. Um, I mean, people have been sleeping since the day where they were born. <laughs> and so for that, to they're still debating the long. reasons why we sleep, but they know that we need it for our physical, mental, and emotional health. So, yeah, no, I, I'm, I am going to take like a side tour here, but I've known people and even Betty White has been known to only need like four hours of sleep a night. Is that truly healthy? And, and can some people only sustain on that and, and be perfectly fine? Yeah. So, I mean, there used to be one genetic marker. There's two now for people who sleep a short amount of time. As I mentioned, there's different, you know, sleep patterns. So they can survive on four to five hours of sleep per night. A good indication of that is someone who is a short sleeper, they wake up alert, they're not exhausted during the day, they don't develop any kind of sleep disorder, but they also don't have things like hypertension, diabetes. I mean, if you find yourself um, with a lot of different health issues with your heart, you know, with a number of different things. And that's, that means that you're not getting adequate sleep. Right. But there are some people that, that, yeah, they can operate on that. We have what's known as a chronotype, right? So a lot of times people say like the secret to success is getting up super early. That's not true for everybody. Oh, I like <laughs> that. Have, like, okay. What are you going to say next? You have your <laughs> early risers, you have your like middle of the road, and then you have like your night owls. I mean, there's variations of different chronotypes. 
I'm what's known as a bear chronotype. So I operate on a good 11 to seven schedule. I go to bed between 11, 1130. I get up around 7 a.m. My highest pro productivity is between like 10 and 12. When you understand your chronotype, then it's easy to optimize your day based on those individual needs, right? Like I exercise in the afternoon because I actually get the most benefit out of my exercise. It helps with my stress management. It helps me to, to be stronger, more flexible. Like there's a whole science that's involved with kind of doing things at certain times. But a lot of times people will ignore that, right? Some people will kind of, you know, get at, to getting a job that is actually, you know, something that that aligns with, with their natural rhythm. But when you're yeah. working against that, like shift workers, that's where we see a lot of the health issues that can be exasperated very quickly. That's really interesting. So like a lot of people, like they feel like they have to conform to the, those hours. And mm -hmm. I find like, so my husband will go to bed at 10 and he gets up at six. I, I can't go to bed that early. I like, I just, you know, I'm like, I lay there for two hours, like, Oh, all right. And so I find that if I, if I go to bed at like midnight or 1230 and I get up at eight or eight 30, it, it works better for me. I've tried to force myself both ways and, and it doesn't work. So it's interesting that everybody is different and you do have to listen to your body and understand what fits better for your situation. I, I would well, say that's that what your chronotype is. It's figuring out like what, if you had complete autonomy over your schedule, what would that look like? Like some of yeah. us kind of call our, you know, some people call themselves night owls because they have so much light disruption that they feel like going to bed later because they already have been sending signals to their brain. Okay. But a lot, it's just finding that pattern. And it's, it's good to know that. I mean, during the last two years, I think a lot of companies have started to recognize that as well, that productivity shot up because people were able to make their own hours, that they were able to start a little mm. bit later at one mm. o'clock and maybe do their shift from one to 10 on the computer at home versus starting at that seven or eight. It's the same thing that we see in our teen population, right? Because they start school way too early. They're kind of coasting through those first two or three hours of, of school in the morning. Yeah. And we've seen through different um like different studies that if they move start times that it increases like grades, graduation rates, um, likelihood for attending college, the economy just across the board, it, it um, translates to so many different uh, areas if we just kind of follow those natural rhythms, but we're just, we make our, our teenagers get up too early in the morning and then we are, you know, they're doing after school activities and it becomes too much. And then they're not only not getting enough sleep, but the quality of that sleep is compromised. You know, and that they're... debate has been going on for years, um, thinking that they should shift the, the younger kids to go earlier instead of the older kids going the earliest and all of that. And yeah, there hasn't been much movement in trying to help that. So when you, when you work with companies and you um, try to educate them, are you trying to educate the company itself in the shifts that they're creating? Or are you actually just trying to help the individual work through those shifts? Both. So I do programming for like HR companies where if it's like a manufacturing company and they're looking, sometimes they hire someone who is an HR, but they really don't know anything about the scheduling. They're making the schedule, but they're not taking into account that our shifts should always be clockwise, never counterclockwise. They shouldn't, you know, if you put someone on for a shift from, you know, one to midnight, then you shouldn't be going like backwards or, or you know, changing it so rapidly. A lot of times I see shift changes from week to week or oh. every three months or six months, and that can be very taxing on the body. So educating about that um, part of it, because that is going to help, you know, reduce likelihood for accidents, workplace accidents, right? It's mm -hmm. going to reduce healthcare costs. There's a number of different things that go into that. You know, when we sleep well, it's a great learning and development tool, right? We're able to focus and concentrate better, retain information. So I talk about it in respect to that. But when I go into seminars um, and I talk directly to, um, you know, their employees, I talk to them about the importance of sleep, the correlation, statistically, some of the things that we see that can happen. But most importantly, where I live is teaching them not necessarily tricks of the trade, but helping them to, again, take that science and apply it to their lives. And I say it's all about going back to the basics. It's understanding how light regulation affects your life, hydration, you know, creating good sleep habits. So it's those, the, you know, sleep hygiene are those practices and habits around sleep, right? And understanding the choices that we make and the consequences of the choices that we make, right? So it's not about an overhaul on someone's life. Mm -hmm. I try to teach them what are the small tweaks that they can make to get the benefits of good sleep. Okay. And you said that you have a retail store. So can people just stop in and what do they expect when they stop in? 
So I do have a retail component. We're only open uh, one day a week. I've moved primarily all of my services to appointment only. So mm -hmm. what I do is private shopping sessions. When I had employees, and even though I, I trained them, it was one thing because they could come in. But a lot of times people are looking to speak with me anyway. So mm -hmm. during the private shopping, uh, private shopping session, they're able to meet with me talk to me a little bit about the challenges that they're experiencing so that I can help recommend a product based on those challenges. So in here, I tell people I'm not target. You can't just come here and like, if it's like, <laughs> if it's like a sleep sachet or if it's like a mag, sure, you can buy that. But with, when it comes to the actual sleep products that I carry, you know, you need to speak with me and we need to figure out if this is the right, the right product for you. You know, I'm okay. not about like, you know, people go to target, they buy melatonin and do all these different things. And they really yeah. misunderstand the timing and the dosing of it. I'm here to educate you so that you're going to get the results that you're looking for. You're not just oh. kind of going out there blindly trying to apply things. That's one of the biggest issues with sleep products is you scroll on Instagram and you see a sleep supplement. So you assume that it's going to be like your solution, yeah. but a lot of times it can actually cause more of a disruption because it depends on what, why you have a sleep challenge. You know, they really yeah. only fall into five different categories when we have challenges with sleeping, it's medical, mm -hmm. hormonal, nutritional stress, or environment. That's where we're looking, right? Okay. So what is it that you need to do? Do you need a new mattress, right? Do you need to assess the air quality in your home? So it's really about finding out that root cause of what's causing the most sleep disruption because it's that one significant thing that causes a ripple in everything else in your life. When you don't sleep well, you make poor nutritional choices. The hormones that regulate your appetite and hunger are, are inverted. So then you're eating more calories the next day. You know, you're eating junk food. You're not motivated to go to the gym because you're feeling sluggish and fatigued from uh, eating additional carbs and sugar. So it's just this continuum that happens, wow. right? But if we get good sleep, it puts us in a better position to make better choices. Wow. So how important is a good pillow? It's very important. Like your pillow and your mattress should support your neck and your back when you sleep. But when it comes to tools in your bedroom, I tell people natural is best because when we sleep at night, things like our mattress, our pillow, like even the furniture in our home emits different toxins into the air that can affect our breathing patterns. So it's what we can't see that often can affect our sleep. So air quality is really important. Making sure the humidity in your home is between 40 to 50%. Lower than that, you can wake up coughing, itchy eyes, dry skin, you know, get into respiratory infections. Uh, higher than that, we can get into like airborne mold in the home. So we want to make sure that we're regulating humidity levels. We want to make sure that we're keeping a cool temperature when we sleep between, you know, 60 to 68 degrees, 60 to 67. I know with, depending if you have central air, air conditioning and so forth, it's by trial and error, but you want to make sure that it's a cool environment. Being cool allows your body to fall asleep and then maintain its sleep, right? Because our body temperature drops about a degree or two, our core body temperature, and that's what oh. maintains our sleep. When we're too hot or we're like, you know, restless and all these different, those sleep disruptions, that's what compromises the quality of our sleep. So how long does that process take for you to, when you meet with somebody? Because it sounds like you have to dive into a few things because you mentioned five things. It really could be more than one of those things, right? It could be thousands of things, but <laughs> I have been doing this for a very long time. <laughs> so, you know, being that I've been in this for 16 years, coming from clinical medicine and, you know, one of the things my doctors used to send patients to me because they'd be like, oh, well, she'll tell you why you need a sleep study or, oh, you, you got your CPAP machine and you still can't sleep. She'll tell you what you, what, what additionally you like need to do. So I've been in this so long, like I know the kinds of questions to ask. I mean, there's some psychology that goes into it, understanding an individual's, you know, uh, motivation factor, the readiness for change, mm -hmm. you know, talking specifically about things that like when someone first I says that they have a challenge, you know, like I'm waking up in the middle of the night, that could be a number of different things, right? So asking them when it started, what's the biggest disruption? Like there's very targeted questions you can ask and very quickly you can, you can determine what's going on. Now, do you I, need to come into the home at all? No, I, I generally will ask questions, you know, like how many windows are in your bedroom? Do you keep it a dark environment? You know, have you ever measured the, the air quality in your home? I ask about different things. What's really great about being, online now and doing a lot of telehealth is that a lot of times people always take the call from their bed and I'm like, <laughs> show me around. And it's so funny because they'll be like, oh yeah, I forgot that I have that light there. I forgot this or that. So it's like, I try to ask some of the questions that I think are really important in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. Plus it takes a little bit for someone to get comfortable, right? To be really, I tell people, I can only help you if you provide me honest information. <laughs> right, right, right. So does it take a, a few sessions with you or can you really help them within like one conversation? 
So my initial consultation is 90 minutes. That where we, that's where we go over an entire evaluation of a number of different factors. Wow. From there, we create a plan. So as a sleep coach, what I do is I put them on a plan. So initially I'll give them kind of a few small recommendations. I'll give them, I keep it a very short one page sleep plan because people don't like to read and they don't like to do homework. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I break down for them those five categories, like, you know, what lifestyle things do I need, think that they need to adjust, what behavioral things are present, if there's something medical, do they need a sleep test, do they need to speak to another specialist, because I'm all about creating that dialogue as well. Uh -huh. There's a difference between fatigue and sleepiness, you know, it might be that they need to speak with an endocrinologist, because I suspect something with their thyroid, like, it's sometimes people don't realize oh. the conversations they should be having. So I open mm -hmm. up that doorway. I'm very fortunate in knowing so many of medical professionals in this area and being able to collaborate with them and serve as a resource. Yeah. You know, I work with not only sleep doctors, but sleep dentists and being able to provide different types of therapy. So it's not just on my own. I'm just kind of that bridge for those conversations to help people know where to look, what questions to ask and how to get the proper help. Because with our healthcare system, it's like until symptoms present themselves or like you're so far gone. That's yeah. when, you know, they, that's when they start applying medication and different things. And what I want is to be on the preventative end. I want to help empower people to, to get to the right place so that they, they can help themselves essentially. So I have a really important question. You, mm -hmm. you you're going in all different directions. <laughs> how, how do you sleep? <laughs> Like, I, sleep well. I sleep well, but the, the important thing to know is that there is no such thing as perfect sleep. People are like, oh, you must sleep perfect every night. And I'm like, no, <laughs> because I live where there's trains sometimes. And sometimes oh. the trains wake me up because my husband wants the windows open. <laughs> but there's no such thing as perfect sleep. The difference between me and the average person is that when my sleep is off, I know what to do to correct it. And I also know enough to say, you know what? It was a bad night. Yeah. It was a bad night because you know what? I made bad choices. I stayed up and maybe I wasn't drinking enough water when I had that glass of wine too close to bed, or I ate something really late because I went to like a carnival or, you know, a festival or, or so forth. The thing is understanding how to reset your sleep. If you stay up till two o'clock in the morning, the answer is not going to bed at eight 30 the next day. The answer is going to bed at your same time because your body needs to know what to do. We okay. have all these little clocks, right? And getting light first thing in the morning, that sends a signal to our, our, optic, our circadian rhythm. It, it turns it on for the day, right? Again, getting it at the noon hour, being exposed to that natural light. Blue light is really important for us during the day, but at night regulating that light, like limiting, um, limiting artificial light sources, right? Because then our body produces melatonin. Melatonin is only triggered by darkness. So the more you're exposed mm. to light, the less melatonin you produce. You can get melatonin from food sources like Mount Morency cherries, uh, goji berries, walnuts, tomatoes, uh, kiwi, pineapple, but we're so quick to reach for these like over-the-counter supplements. Yeah. And a lot of times they're sold in way larger dosages than are, you know, than are necessary. And we're seeing like individuals overdosing on it, uh, having mm -hmm. a lot of side effects, you know, nightmares, dry mouth, like it can interact with medications. So there are ways you can, you know, light is the natural way to boost it, but you can also boost it through foods. So my recommendation is to lay off the melatonin tablets. It's not your wow. solution. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's good to know. Okay. So I've got a couple questions. Where are you located? And, and people should, it sounds like people should call first. Yeah. So most of the things are on, I have an online booking, so you can book uh, shopping sessions, consultations, assessments, any services that we have are all online. We're located at 1211 Hurdle Avenue in Buffalo, New York. So we're next okay. to the antique land company um, diagonal from Lombardo's uh, Italian restaurant. Okay. Um, we're open every day of the week, except for, so I say Monday through Saturday, but it's through online appointments that you generally catch me because I'm a okay. busy <laughs> and, and so what advice do you have for people that are listening right now that really are struggling to get a good night's sleep? Um, and it could be whether they're menopause, where they're struggling with little toddlers when they're working, you know, night shifts could be all of that. But what, what three pieces could you give that maybe all of them could try? I would say if you're looking to reset your sleep on your own, to go back to the basis basics and the basics are, um, light water and air light. There was a study out of Toronto that showed that just paying attention to light regulation, First thing in the morning, that first 10 minutes is equivalent to four to six hours of afternoon light, right? Kickstarts our circadian rhythm. It also helps us produce serotonin, which are happy chemicals that stabilizes our mood, but it also helps our body produce melatonin later. So light in the morning, light in the afternoon between 12 and 2 p.m., 
limiting, our, limiting artificial sources of light at night. A study showed that if you just do that, improve um, the ability to fall asleep quicker by 83%, just by light regulation alone. So light is the number one way to wow. reset your sleep. Hydration. Most people, if you ask them honestly, they're terrible about hydration, right? Mm -hmm. But when we are dehydrated, it, we have issues with focus, concentration, sluggishness, but sleep in itself is a very dehydrating event. So drinking a cup of room temperature water first thing in the morning to replenish ourselves because it is dehydrating, right? It can also lead to inflammation in the body. But most importantly, when we drink enough water, it flushes out excess cortisol levels. So if you tend to be stressed, right? You're trying to manage your stress, drink water. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then air, uh, air quality, remembering to breathe, breathing, right? Taking those deep daily pauses helps us to manage our stress. But the way that we breathe during the day also dictates the way that we breathe at night. And then looking at air quality in your home is one of the biggest things we, you know, we have poor air quality here now, right? With the humidity levels, Yeah. But looking at that temperature, that humidity, even investing in an air quality tester in your home. We have so many things that emit toxins into the air that we don't see. If you use a gas stove, a printer, you know the type of um, material that your furniture is made of. And at night, those levels elevate and that affects our deep sleep and our REM sleep. And that's our physical mm -hmm. recovery, how our immune system gets reinforced and how memory consolidation happens. So it's important to make sure that we're going through those stages. So if we're not paying attention to air quality, it could be compromising um, the quality of our sleep at night. Wow. So I have a question about the water. What does it have to be? Um, you said lukewarm? Yes. So it's room temperature. So it's okay. based on Ayurvedic medicine. So it's, so it's not shocking to the system. So room temperature water. Oh, okay. Yeah. Never. What about lemon? Do with the way does lemon it, help you in any way? Huh? Does lemon help you in any way? I've yeah, I mean, that. there's there's benefits to that. For me, I just I have a water bottle and I fill it the night before, and then like I drink that water first thing in the morning because we lose about a liter of humidity through our breath when we sleep at night. And if oh. you tend to be a hot sleeper, you also perspire that. So it's important to replenish ourselves first thing in the morning. Okay, I'm gonna try all these things. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of information. Good thing this is recorded. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, yeah. I, but I think it's all it's all really. I don't know. I mean. Um, we, we've gotten so busy in our lives that we don't think of some of these basic things that I think we probably um, should ap absolutely do. It, it's interesting when you were talking about um, workers and shifts and things like that in, in the profession of being, becoming a, a doctor and the hours that they put them through on a continuous basis to try to keep them awake and functional as a doctor, you know, and well, they're, they're looking, you know, they've changed that a little bit, but even yeah. with, you know, becoming a health educator, sleep health educator, they get very limited training. They only get about three hours in the United States. Globally, that number drops to two hours total in sleep health and sleep medicine. So they get limited to no training, which is why I have that certification program because there aren't there aren't certification programs or education out there. A lot of the ones that we're even starting to see now focus on, again, that clinical sleep medicine aspect, right? And we have sleep doctors for that. If someone needs a sleep study, they should be sent to a specialist for that. That isn't something that should be managed by someone else. But helping to educate on sleep health, I think, is one of those things that is just really overlooked and really needs to be part of every health conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if people just a, just a side note, my my website, www.startwithsleep.com, there's a learn tab. So if you're interested in learning more about like light or, you know, like humidity, natural ways to humidify your home or things like plants, I have blogs and articles on there where you can read and it's a resource for that type of education if you're looking for additional Insight. Great. Cause that was my next question. Where could people get more information about you and your company? So they can just go right to your website to get yes. that. All right. Well, Soda, thank you so much. I've learned so much in a very short period of time. And I really, I want to like try all these things, um, things that I really actually hadn't really thought about, but just the fact of drinking water right away in the morning, I always heard it for weight loss and helping you in those areas. Um, but nothing to ever have to do to impact my, my night sleep. And, you know, I don't, and I have no idea and this, you would be a good person to ask this. So uh, I was doing intermittent fasting for a mm -hmm. while and the only benefit, I did not lose one pound, but the only benefit that I had coming out of that was it absolutely helped my sleep. Is there any logic to that? Yeah. So, I mean, with the school of thought for that, I always laugh when people talk about intermittent fasting, because I'm like, we all do that because when you sleep, you do not eat unless, unless you have an eating sleep disorder. <laughs> so <laughs> in, some, in some fashion, we're all fasting in one way or another. Um, 
it can be a benefit to some people with others. It can, like you said, you didn't lose weight, but when you don't have healthy gut lining, we can actually see it have the adverse effects. So it all depends on like your gut bacteria and, and now whether or not that's something that is suitable for you, because if not, when you fast, what it does is it multiplies like the bad bacteria. So it can actually cause a bigger issue. So, I mean, you'd have to speak to a healthcare professional about that, but as, and as it relates to sleep, we always yeah. talk about that. I mean, it can help in that it helps that 24 hour clock because for our circadian rhythm, we're on a 24 hour clock. So if we're eating meals consistently at the same day, same time, drinking water, you know, waking up at the same time, right? All of those things are cues to our body to know what to do within oh. that 24 hour period. So that's where things like fasting, it puts you on a schedule. So if you're following a certain pattern, your body knows when to produce certain hormones. We have yeah. 50 hormones that start and stop certain functions in our body, right? And we get our cues from all these outside factors. So it's those day-to-day mm-hmm. -day lifestyle choices that kind of set all of that stuff in motion. And that all makes sense because I was, I would start and stop eating at a certain time. And one of the things was I was not eating at night, which really did help sleep anyways. Um, but I was definitely on a schedule and, and that probably, cause I, I, it amazed me how, how much better I was sleeping, um, by just, you know, it didn't have anything to do with losing weight. It just helped yeah. me sleep a well, lot when better. We sleep too, our digest, you know, our digestion is at work as well. So if you're eating too close to bedtime, that can be, you know, uh, disruptive to your sleep. There's a no, yeah. but again, it's all based on the individual. Some people have more sensitivity than others. And that's uh -huh. why, you know, speaking oh. to a specialist and understanding your individual sleep is very individualistic. So understanding the circumstances um, that will benefit you. That's why yeah. finding something on Instagram or trying what your sister or your neighbor tried doesn't necessarily work for you because right. your sleep is a unique experience. So you need to, to pay attention to what your body needs. Yeah. So if you're having trouble sleeping for whatever reason, um, I would highly recommend to reach out to Soda uh, just to to get that um, initial conversation started just to see, because boy, when you have a good night's sleep, it really changes your disposition and, and it affects your relationships. It affects everything because you're happier and, and you feel well rested. So, so thank you so much for spending some time today talking to us about this. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. And thank you for everybody for um, taking time out to listen to Sharp Human Resources and Sharp HR Career Corner. For those that have been sitting on the fence and they're hating their job, thinking about making a move, but not sure where to begin, contact Sharp HR. We can help you make sense of the process. Go to sharphumanresources-buffalo.com. Until next time, be kind, everyone. We need to show a lot more kindness in the world, and it starts with you and I. Thanks for listening, and have a great day.